Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Becoming Women podcast with me, your host, Ella Sims, where each week I speak with inspiring women about their teenage years. If this is your first time listening, a very warm welcome to you. And if you're a regular listener, then thank you. My mission with this podcast is to support teenage girls as they navigate the ups and downs of growing up. In each episode, I talk with grown women about their individual journeys as a teenager, the highs and lows, any challenges they may have faced, and what advice they would share with their younger self to help reassure you that you are not alone and those tricky teenage years will pass. This week's episode, I'm with Sophie Caldercott. Sophie is a writer first and foremost, and always has been. Some of her earliest memories involve scribbling in notebooks before she knew how to read or write, and used to steal her mother's dictaphone so that she could interview family members and record her observations about the world. After studying English literature at Durham, Sophie did an MA in magazine journalism in London, and then went on to work in digital media and marketing for six years before starting her own freelance copywriting and marketing consultancy business two years ago. Sophie teaches creatives and small businesses how to get discovered via Google using SEO, help them tell their stories with intentional copywriting and flourish online. She has a passion for small, ethical businesses and believes we all have a role in making the world a better place. In Sophie's spare time, she runs an online creative writing club for people who are dreaming of writing books called The Writing Habit and writes her own stories and poetry mostly about and for her two little girls. meeting with me today um, and being on today's episode of Becoming Women and I just wanted to get started straight away if that's okay and start talking about your childhood and the experiences that that you've had sort of in your younger years and with your family. Yeah thank you for inviting me to be a part of your beautiful project. Oh that's okay you're welcome and meeting me here in Cambridge we're actually in a a really nice um, sort of like a brasserie pub um, called the Station Tavern. It's really lovely and we're in a, in a nice quiet spot but you may hear some tinkering of glasses in the background. What what would you like to start with? <laughs> well um, I was thinking about my uh, childhood and teen years um, on the train on the way yeah. up here and kind of um, getting emotional about the all of the different things that were going on because it's such a mixed bag I think for everybody. Um, but I had a very, very loving and creative and supportive family, which is mm-hmm. a real um, blessing. And growing up, I think I um, felt very free to experiment and, and create and always kind of trying to uh, write little stories and poems and mm-hmm. um, trying to invent things. <laughs> <laughs> I remember at one point being a tester trying to make a go kart because I oh, wanted cool. to, but that didn't really take off. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm not very technically, or you know, technically um, proficient. But it was the kind of um, childhood where I just played a lot. And yeah, lived in books and fairy tales and played make believe games with my sisters, and um, we didn't have um, a, a lot of money, and so, um, but we also didn't feel like we wanted for anything. When I um, went to, um, from year four to year five, mm-hmm. that I think I was the last year group that um, shifted from uh, primary school to junior school before going on to senior school. Um, okay. And so I left my primary school that I'd been at for four years, uh, for the, uh, you know, up till year four, and um, went to senior school um, and sorry, no, the intermediate junior school yeah. before senior school. It was quite a shock to my system that changed because it was going into, it was it was a school that you had to take an entrance exam okay. for. So I think just from that, and it was an all-girls school, going yeah. to an all-girls school from a mixed school. And just by nature of having to take an exam to get in, I think it was a little bit competitive. Okay. Or it, just a different atmosphere. And... Um, even though people were wearing school uniforms 
it was just the point in time which, which, in which I became aware of the concept of cool or yeah. you know like how short is your skirt or like what clothes do you wear on home clothes day yeah so and everyone has an image yeah, yeah I felt very much like an outsider at that school and was very unhappy for about two years a little bit longer maybe yeah I really struggled to find my feet and I remember um crying in the car <laughs> outside the school saying to mum or daddy or whoever was dropping me off yeah. I don't want to go in I don't want to go in I hated it so much <laughs> that's really difficult when there's so what age would you've been then sort of 10 yeah maybe? Nine, yeah 10, 11 Age. Yeah, it's really horrible when you start somewhere new and it's so daunting anyway and then you've yeah. got all of these feelings and you don't want to leave people behind that you feel so yeah. secure with. Yeah, and I think some of it was also, um, I got quite, I had a um, kidney infection so I missed quite a lot of school okay. in the first bit of um, term, I think just as we were settling. I think that just... I felt like I had kind of missed the bit where everyone formed groups and, you know, friendships and kind of got settled. And um, also I think I had been very, very lucky up to that point of feeling completely free to be myself and yeah. very comfortable and confident. And certainly that shift mm -hmm. made me realise how lucky I had been up yeah. until that point. But I was quite grateful in the end for that time in my life even though it was difficult um, because it did make me realise I didn't have to fit into a clique or a, yeah. a group and I didn't have to kind of follow the crowd so mm -hmm. I, I remember feeling like I had a choice at that point um, to either you know have the right length skirt and insist on <laughs> having the right type, type of shoes you know even though you have a uniform there's all these uh, un kind of spoken rules about yep. what's cool and what's not um, yeah and I had my sister's kind of hand me down to me as we get the second hand stuff mm -hmm. and then which is now obviously seems completely ridiculous but at the time um just these little things add up to make you feel like not quite you're not quite fitting in looking back later having it at that point in my life before the teen years really hit mm -hmm. meant that I think I knew I had a choice to either try and make all those efforts, those mm -hmm. little efforts to fit in and be, you know, um, have <laughs> the right kind of cards stuck to the inside of my desk, you know, yep. or the right kind of things in your locker, uh, talk about the right kind of um, music and books and stuff and hide my Kiki stamp collecting Lord of the Rings loving side. <laughs> yeah. Um, or to just be myself yeah. and weather the storm a little bit yeah. and be a bit lonely and be a bit uncomfortable um, and I'm glad that I did that because and I think obviously having the loving background and family yeah. to, to support me through that meant that I could do that more mm -hmm. I was more empowered to do that because um, because I could go home and have a good cry about it and <laughs> um, feel loved and accepted at home I think it must be really hard if you don't have that to yeah. know kind of who you are and stick with it but um it meant that later on when I was a, a teenager and people were going through bigger uh, life changes and things um and facing stronger pressures mm -hmm. than just what kind of uniform to wear and stuff yeah um I had developed a muscle of not fitting in um and being okay with not fitting in yeah. entirely so I never for example felt pressured to go to any parties that I didn't I didn't I just didn't understand why you would do something like that if you didn't want to and I think yeah. that is because I had not I'd gone through that couple of really rough years of not fitting in and just deciding it's okay yeah <laughs> I'm gonna I survived this and I'm happier in myself knowing that I'm kind of being true to myself than um trying to bend myself in little ways yeah it's easier to stand up about the, the big things than later I think did you find that friends were kind of going through the same sort of thing yeah so I I remember one I had a couple of friends who came with me to the new school yeah. and um, they one of the painful things about that time was that they stepped away from me and fitted in and I wasn't cool so I didn't I kind of was like um, not who you wanted to hang around with necessarily if yeah. you wanted to be in with the cool girls yeah. so it was painful to watch them 
like make, make a different choice you, and fit in and yeah. go and cut you know um when you kind of innocently turn to someone and think they'll come and sit with you but mm-hmm, actually mm-hmm. then they kind of pretend not to know you or you mm-hmm. try and refer to a shared interest and they're like blanking yeah yeah like what are you talking about oh gosh I didn't know about that that (laughs) that experience I think is just so so common Mm. um where you're you've known someone for a really long time and you've had a really close relationship and then sometimes you'd go into school one day and it would be completely different and you would wonder why they're they're behaving in a different way towards you so and I think everyone was just finding their feet mm-hmm. and, and ultimately um, I think sometimes you, it, you do have to do what you have to do to survive a little bit and keeping yep. your head down sometimes is yep. what you have to do um, and again you know it made me realise that the value of someone who doesn't, um, doesn't play by the rules it feels like everyone else is playing by um, you know when someone's really really genuinely kind and doesn't care about their image and yeah. they just um, befriend you or they uh, speak up for you yes. in a situation yeah. where you feel a bit alone you realise the worth of that and it taught me to want to be like that myself mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. and and now my, my closest friends um, I think I, it kind of gave me this instinct for identifying the kind of person who would um not worry about cool yeah I, I'm very very attracted to people to, to friendships that um that are kind of grounded in that deep empathy and uh uh desire to really know you and listen to you mm-hmm. and um yeah find find common ground mm-hmm. despite differences and things I love I just love people I'm really drawn to people who uh, don't seem to think about themselves you know how mm-hmm. they're coming across very much yeah. they, they'll drop everything to wave you know they'll they'll not worry about looking a bit silly or asking yeah. the wrong question or yeah um yeah being a bit too enthusiastic you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's really a beautiful thing when you find it yeah definitely I couldn't agree more and you mentioned you went to an all-girls school how did you how did you find that as I guess as amongst all of the other things that you've just talked about? It played a part in uh, making me a, a bit insecure about around other women for a mm. while. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, had, I have two sisters, so I had quite a female home life as well. But yeah. um, in the school environment was very, it was very emotionally kind of um, intense, I think some of the friendship stuff might have been a bit easier if there had been boys around mm. to just um, dilute well, actually, it you know, I don't know maybe I don't know what it's like to go to a mixed school as you're going into that new phase maybe it's maybe it's intensified by, by girls trying to kind of <laughs> girls and boys trying to impress each other I don't know but m- it definitely gave me a slight fear of all female situations mm. socially okay so I was very very happy going to university that um, mixed um, environment and yep. just really enjoying friendships with um, with guys and for the different perspective on life that yep. that they had and also there's something uniquely uh, there's something unique to the way that when you get when you approach a group of women or girls um, mm. they kind of often will flick flick their eyes up and down you know like as they scan you as they kind yep. of try and assess I think we so many of us do it kind of accidentally yeah like a yeah in built habit um but it can be very intimidating to approach a group of women for me even now I get a little bit nervous about it because I mm. feel like um rightly or wrongly I feel like they're making all kinds of judgments yeah. about me kind of snap in a snap way and I'm, I think everybody does that whether you're a boy or a girl yeah but just from having that mm-hmm. negative experience at animal girls school I think it, it did instill a little bit of a fear of female judgment in particular yeah. but at the same time I never I always had very close female friends and my sisters so it wasn't mm-hmm. so much it didn't harm individual relationships I think it was more yeah this group setting that I felt that the dynamics can be a little bit uh, just a little bit unpleasant sometimes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and did you find schoolwork amongst all of that 
um, easy? Was that easier in comparison to friendships with, um, I guess, your peers and with other girls? Was that something that you found relatively easy or did you have challenges there as well? Yeah, so I always found things that I was interested in flowed very easily. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually it was mostly the things that I struggled with, maths and science, um, were mostly just because if I didn't find something interesting, I really was very lazy and I still am very lazy at those things. So and sports actually so it was like the creative <laughs> subjects and yeah. English that always came very naturally and always felt a little bit like I was cheating because it just it wasn't what it didn't feel like work yeah it was um I think I do remember one time I was a bit of a geek about things that I loved mm-hmm. and then would kind of really not try in the areas that yeah. I didn't find interesting and I got one of the things um when I was a little bit older in senior school um, that kind of hurt my feelings but was one of the cool girls at one point was going around saying um, what a loser I was because I had spent so much time on my coursework from my music coursework right um, and at that point actually I was confident enough in myself to just laugh it off and yeah say, well, I, I love this and that's why I wanted to spend my weekend yeah. doing this rather than something else so I don't think it really impacted um, impacted my work and those creative things and those things that I loved became more of a refuge maybe. Mm-hmm. I felt like everybody was very equal socially in, mm-hmm. a, in an English class where you're talking about a book that you love. Yes, you yeah. You kind of forget about all of the... Things that were going on outside the classroom, yeah. yeah. And did you have any... I guess mixed in with all of that, sometimes there are things going on at home or that are a a bit more personal, not that any of that is a a personal experience, Um, but did you have anything else that added an additional weight to to those years? My, throughout my um, childhood and teen years, my my dad was um, very, very values led in his work and Mm -hmm would um, kind of struggle to keep one job for one reason or another because he often would, he worked in publishing and editing and uh, would sometimes quit a job on a, on a matter of principle and then, right. um, or, or, um, or get fired or um, the job, the um, company he was working for would get dissolved and move, you know, um, incorporated into something else. Um, mm-hmm. And so he, his job was often changing and that was kind of behind some of the financial instability that we had. Okay. Um, and I didn't really, I wasn't really aware of that when I was younger, but also my, my mum sacrificed her own career more or less to, yeah, um, when we were very young to look after us and yeah. support my dad in his kind of shifting career. Um, yeah. And then none of those things were things I was really very aware of when I was younger. Okay. But, um, coming into kind of my teen years, um, I, yeah, I think became more aware of the things that my parents were struggling with. Yeah. And, um, but they, they had a way of always making us feel like we were safe no matter what was going on in terms mm-hmm. of work and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. Also, like, we were a team as a family. Um, and so I had an awareness of, um, I had a part time job from the age of, I think, 15. I did some, a peek around and then worked in various <laughs> cafes and yeah. I was a terrible, terrible waitress but I persisted at trying to do that for quite a long time <laughs> and then working in a shop on Saturdays and stuff and it was actually fun to, I think, really healthy also to have an awareness of um, money and how and, and how you need to contribute in a kind of family setting to yes, looking yeah. after the house and yeah. looking after your own things and my, my mum also had um, a, quite a traumatic childhood with a alcoholic mother and um, quite a lot of emotional abuse from her mother and so okay. these are all things that I became a bit more aware of yeah. as I was growing up um, yeah. to realise that your parents have needs as well and yes. it's quite, yeah. quite, takes quite a big mental shift yeah. <laughs> as a very privileged child who's surrounded by love and support yeah. to then realise oh you know wow she had this really incredibly difficult experience as a child and how this is impacting 
her still now. Yeah, um, yeah. Kind of awakens uh, something, you know, a sense of responsibility and yeah. for other people. And I think all of that was in, always in the background, but mm. in, a, in a way that kind of just, it was like a slow awakening to mm. how how privileged I was and how uh, in having such a lovely um, home environment yeah and how much work that actually took to create for my parents and now as a parent myself I can see how much sacrifice that takes to to create that kind yeah of home. I think awakening is is the right word and it was something that I was actually going to use myself because mm. it's it's not just one day that you wake up and you realize these things it's just gradually over time if you hear conversations that your parents have together or things that they say to you and then it, it starts to twig in your own in your own mind oh so this is what happened to my father or this is what happened to my mother and they're feeling like this today because of that or they're teaching me to behave like this or give me this moral or value because of what they went through Um, and it it is interesting how when you are a teenager you you gradually learn that I also need to take care of them Mm -hmm. to a certain extent or our family like they have with me up until this point Uh, I remember when this is a small thing but I remember when my sisters and I realised that um, my parents didn't get stockings um, at Christmas and well, we just thought that was really sad and so we started um, something that we called the secret club I hope they don't mind me telling everybody about the secret <laughs> not so secret yeah, club no. um, but we would collect um, pocket money throughout the year and then yep. collect little stocking presents and then make stockings for them at Christmas oh. that was just a, like a little moment of realising I don't know that we, we were really lucky to have mm-hmm. That and think, I guess, I guess it's kind of limited empathy because parents don't necessarily mind about that so much. But yep. as a kid, you're like, oh my goodness, they don't get stockings. It's the same things God. that we have. They yeah, it's terrible. So yeah. yeah. Um, but um, yeah, a little. Bit. And then as I as I got older, I think it was more to do with just coming to empathise with what it means to not have a mother who supports you and makes mm-hmm. you feel loved and accepted. Yes. Because I was so lucky to have that, and mm-hmm. it was quite a shock to realise that mum, my mum didn't have that. Well, I remember another thing. I remember very clearly was to do with the um, to do with the idea of fitting in or mm. kind of going with the flow. One major thing was that when we were in our mid-teens, I think everybody started having boyfriends, and mm-hmm. um, I wasn't. I didn't feel interested already in in that way and I remember having a very clear idea of the kind of um boy or man that I would be interested in eventually yeah yeah and knowing that he wasn't anyone that was in front of me right then and there there was this one very clear interaction I had with a girl at school who was kind of amazed that I hadn't had a boyfriend yet and mm-hmm. um wasn't particularly interested in having a boyfriend. How old were you? We were, I was trying to think how old I was. We must have been about 16. Okay. Or 17, maybe. It was, I remember we were in the drama department, so we must have been rehearsing for something. And um, she was asking me kind of what what kind of things I would look for in a guy. Yeah. I I gave her this list and it was, you know, like funny, interesting. Mm -hmm gentle uh you know have all these interests in common and shared values and shared faith and things um and I got to the end of the list and she just laughed at me and said that I would never find somebody like that and I'd be waiting for a long time if I was looking for that kind of person and I remember That's thinking harsh. that my list wasn't there it was yeah but my list wasn't very it wasn't specific in a kind of way of you know being picky that yeah think, um you know he has, needs to have this color hair and needs yeah. to be this tall or whatever um it was very values based and I think I uh, it was more about like how he needs to make me feel and mm-hmm. the kind of kind person that he needs to be kind and interesting um and the kind of relationship that I wanted where we would feel 
comfortable with each other and um, yeah. with each other's families and things like that. And so I remember really clearly thinking, feeling sorry for her and feeling sorry that she felt like she wouldn't be able to hold out for somebody like that. You know, mm -hmm. that she would, that it was asking too much, that those things would be asking too much from a guy. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and it was it was funny because my when I met my husband, I guess if I was about fifteen, at the point of that conversation, and I met him about eight or nine years later, I thought back to that conversation when I met him because yeah. I thought, well, at that point I didn't know that we were going to um, end up getting married, but I did think, oh, well, she was wrong. This type of person does exist. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I'm glad that I had a really clear idea of yeah. who I wanted to be with and I stuck with that because it felt like her um, her, her dismissal of that um, was based on feeling like you'll have to settle yes, or, yeah. or, it, or it maybe too just much to ask. Or a, just a sense of naivety, I, I, yeah. I guess. I Hearing that story, it does make me think that you definitely had a better sense of sort of self-awareness I think at that age than I did because I'm just thinking did I write a list or anything like that or did I know what I wanted but is, do you think there's anything that influenced you in that way or made you think in that way about who you were looking for in, in the future not say right there and then yeah. when you're 15, 16 but in 10 years time I think um it probably was, I don't know, a combination of um, being very lucky in the love and support of my parents in terms of, um, don't know, feeling like I didn't have to compromise what, mm -hmm. I, what I wanted because I knew that I had an inherent worth or value and that I could, I could see in my parents' partnership mm -hmm. what I wanted for yeah. myself. And, um, but I think that's, that's kind of come second. So I think first, when you're that age, you're not even thinking about necessarily who you want to marry or just thinking about dating or mm. you know who you have a crush on but I think I didn't have I genuinely didn't have crushes on the boys around me because they weren't I don't know it felt silly it felt like yeah. playing a game yeah but they weren't ready yet and I wasn't either yeah but I think maybe some of that um having that kind of long-term vision of what I wanted yeah. that clarity about that particular issue probably came from my faith background, um, which was definitely oriented to, relationships oriented towards marriage or thinking yeah. long term. Not yeah. that I would date um, only to get married. But, yes, yeah. Um, just having like a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. it, it was, I guess I was encouraged to think in terms of what I wanted, um, from my life and my work and my relationships in a kind of bigger picture way. So I would say kind of thinking in terms of vocation rather than, and kind of being, so having a, I would say I would have a vocation, I always felt I had a calling to write and in my work. And so part of growing up was figuring out if I also had a vocation or a calling to, to, to marriage. And part of that you can't know until you meet the right person. It was all, I think, contributed to like, an encouragement to think in, more in the long term rather than um, feel like you have to just do things because people around you are yeah. doing them. I also wanted to ask you as well about, and you touched on it a little bit just then, about your, your faith. Mm. Um, how did that influence you during your teenage years? So it was a, a big part of... Well, it's hard to untangle it but mm -hmm. it, was, it was a big part of my the loving and supportive background the ho home environment that I came from and a big part of the reason that I didn't fit in at school um, I think because of <laughs> when I I mentioned the kind of things that you have in your locker or your, your desk and I remember switching to the other school the new school and I had pictures <laughs> It's kind of embarrassing to admit even now, but um, I had pictures of different saints stuck in my, stuck in my inside the inside of my desk, where other people had posters of their favorite bands or whatever. Yeah. Uh, pop pop stars. Um, I think Christina Aguilera was really big in Year Five. Yes. I remember, <laughs> I remember everyone being like, "How do you pronounce her name?" 
um, it did definitely make me feel like an outsider and also things like fasting during Lent and I had to um, go to uh, certain um, on certain holy days there would be um, a mass that I would need to go to that clashed with school so I'd have to get permission to kind of leave early or come in late or whatever yeah. so all of that doesn't help when you're trying to fit in but at the same time I it gave me so much um, emotional support and it also was just infused my home life with um, the, the values of my parents were um, what they were because of their faith so I couldn't really have I couldn't really have one without the other and so it, I understood the value of it I just sometimes I think resented that it made me stick out like a sore thumb yeah. in certain ways uh, my parents didn't come from a traditional so I, I grew up Catholic and my parents didn't come up from a traditional background neither of them came from a traditional background They, my dad's parents were bohemians and um very anti-established religion and Mm -hmm. um, his he became Catholic when he was uh, in his 20s I think um, later and my mum came from a kind of loosely Anglican background but yeah again she became Catholic a little bit after my dad did Um, so before I was born but Mm -hmm. later in their a little bit later in their lives and so so they had a very eclectic kind of approach to spirituality we're always having interesting people around for dinner and kind of philosophical, theological um, debates at the dinner yeah. table and stuff. So yeah. it felt very natural to me to uh, ask questions and think in terms of spirituality and faith. Mm-hmm. And going to a secular school meant that I did not really fit in, but also that I um, was very used to debating. So nothing, no, no kind of um, questions or debates would upset me because mm-hmm. I enjoyed genuinely enjoyed thinking about and talking about things and I think it also was a real gift that my parents gave me to go to a secular school not a, not be kept in a little bubble because yeah. um, it helped me realize just the value of different um, different people's experiences and yeah I've always enjoyed um, getting to know that part of people and thinking about them how these things impact the way that we live and Mm -hmm. the values that we have and um it was yeah I think it was a gift not to fit in in that sense as well because if you I think if you get too comfortable and think everybody believes the same things as you um it can be a shock when you when you're an adult and you go into the wider Mm -hmm. world and realize it's not the case and even though um you know you you started with talking about pictures of saints in your lockers and things like that even though it it meant that people I guess maybe made a judgment or didn't see that as an an image that fitted in with their circle of of friends or whatever I think that having any sort of faith at at that age and to be regularly attending church Mm. or um, you know another spiritual space I think it does give you a a security, a different type of security yeah. that someone wouldn't necessarily get if they they weren't doing that. Yeah, I think it's a a bigger picture security because you're used to thinking about. I think you. I, I was used to thinking about things like um, what happens when you die, what mm. happens, um, what matters most in life. Yeah, thinking in terms of the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. And, what values do I want to live by? What values do we live by as a family? Yes, yeah. um, what do you prioritise? What, what do relationships mean? And yeah. What's my inherent worth and value yeah. as a person? Um, or how do you treat someone yeah. in this sort of scenario? Yeah. That's it. I think that's a gift that doesn't always feel like a gift when you're a teenager and you're trying mm. to, again, trying to fit in and just yeah. not, not stick out and not be the object of ridicule or whatever. But um, it, it, was, it was a guiding... And it still is a guiding kind of force that helps helped me make decisions yeah. um, and helped me know what I felt comfortable about, you know, doing and not doing. And also just, again, it, I, I mentioned this before, but I think when somebody does um, see past the label and really engage mm-hmm. with who you are and what you value and they come and 
hang out with you despite the fact that you have saints cards <laughs> stuck yes. up on your um, desk and things. Um, they, you, you realize, I think that really is the mark of a really interesting person when, mm-hmm. they, when they are able to look past a label and kind of really see you in the heart of who you are yeah. um, and engage with that and, and again ask questions and things. So it's almost, I don't know, I think difference, whether it's religious or whether it's something else entirely, can be a gift sometimes, even when mm. it feels like a struggle, because it does attract a, a, a better type of person, a more <laughs> open-minded type yes. of person. Often you can, it kind of sort does the trick of sorting out. Um, yeah, so it helps you, so instead of you having to do it, it... Yeah. consciously so, yeah exactly yeah. so I mean so you end up meeting some very interesting people because they're the people who are willing to step yeah. outside um, mm-hmm. of their comfort zone or their their bubble and engage with you and you're very obviously different bubble that I, I've always found those people to be the just wonderful wonderful human yeah. beings and yeah. um, having some kind of difference about you yes often forces that for you even sometimes when you would prefer it to and I was you know it's not I I wonder if um, if it was a more I think as an adult I can hide it a bit better than mm-hmm. I did as a child and I have to try and encourage myself not to do that because um, I find the more a habit of having a habit of openness about you it does just lead to much more fulfilling relationships and interesting conversations than then yeah trying to fit in yeah and so in a way I need to kind of go back to that habit that I had as a child and a teenager of yeah being really open about who I was almost out of defiance almost out of because I didn't have a choice about it didn't feel like um something I could hide at the time yeah and I think when yeah. you grow up and um, get a bit older if you, you can get into habits of fitting in and just mm. keeping your head down mm-hmm. um, but yeah I think it's really nice to think about it's really helpful to think about that time because yeah I um, I didn't I didn't feel I didn't feel like I could live a life of hiding who I was so I just kind of went for it and um, it's something to get back to yeah little takeaway from today <laughs> yeah <laughs> And speaking of today, how, what are your thoughts and how do you feel about the pressures on teenage girls today? Yeah, I wonder, so I mentioned I have um, two daughters and I'm yes. yep. kind of terrified to see how technology mm. will play a part in their lives. But at the same time, it's been a real gift to me because yep. I've been um, able to have a really fulfilling career off off the beaten track of you know maybe go working in an office and living yeah. in a, a central very central place mm. um, and so it's been a real gift to me so I don't want to be scared of technology I guess the thing that worries me is that um, things you know everyone worries about the pressures of social media and also the likelihood of people finding really disturbing things online and getting sucked into kind of bad habits and things but I have seen um, some teenage girls struggling with the types of things I was struggling with, but in an almost uh, bringing it into the home life because right. when I when I was growing up, I think I could put the culture at school or the pressures that I was feeling at school aside when I came home. So it does it makes me sad to think that that pressure then extends with, yeah. with social media and technology that could extend into the home life more and more yeah. as people are bringing you know on their phones at yes home yeah um, rather than it being left sort of yeah, at the school gate it was always such a relief for me to go home and leave it there at school I think that must be a struggle and I mentioned the, the, the feeling of never feeling like I had to go to a party yes and yeah. if I didn't want to or not being particularly bothered about being left out in that sense but yeah. I think that's easy for me to say now as somebody I think I got I got a flip phone when I was maybe 16 or mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. that I shared with my sister and it was okay. like a practical thing that we yep. used to phone our parents when we were 
out or make plans with people. But I mean, it didn't have any of the, uh, yeah. any of the social media on it or anything. Yeah. Or even email. Um, so I think all you could do was call, text, and then was there some kind of like Tetris game? Probably? Yeah, yeah. Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So it was just very different. It was very practical. Mm. So in that sense, it, it's easy for me to say that I didn't, you know, I didn't feel that pressure or I mm. didn't succumb to that pressure because actually I couldn't see what I was missing out on mm-hmm. necessarily. You hear people talking about it the next day at school maybe, but you know that you had a good time doing whatever you were doing. So yeah. it's, it, it's not in your face in the same way. Um, so I think that must be hard. But also, I wonder if um, I, I was... I loved. I always loved magazines, and I mm-hmm. went into magazine journalism. Yes, yeah. Um, and I always saw it as kind of an art form. But I wonder. Um, so, in terms of body image and stuff, I wonder. I always knew a magazine feels very separate somehow. Mm. Um, and I wonder if the the kind of images of people, supposedly real life people, mm-hmm. in social media, would make that all harder. I know. I'm curious to see how that plays out. I'm open to it being a a good thing. I think it's you know it is what it is. It's um, mm. it can be it's a tool and it can be used in multiple different ways. And I just hope that I can be supportive of my yeah. daughters when um, when they're teenagers to help them figure out t- how to use things in yeah. a way that feels good for them and that, that they're secure in their yes. themselves. Yeah. I think it's hard to know what's going to happen, but with social media, it's a you know it's a global tool. It's used by everybody, um, and I feel like there must be some way of streamlining it a- across the world to make it sort of a, a safer and secure place for, especially for younger people. I think also it if it didn't exist, something else. Mm. Would so, I think it's easy to talk about things like body image and things being easier when it wasn't social media wasn't around or a fear of missing out or any uh, things like that um, and pre- social pressures and feeling alienated and alone. But there were, I think people we have to learn. It's a it's a new it's a new area that's always developing. And we have to be careful about it. But I think pe- the main thing is still the same instilling in ourselves a sense of what our values are and who we are and a respect for for ourselves and for each other and um, a sense of having a sense of your worth and Mm -hmm. everything else stems from that so if you social media or no social media if you um if you have that deep sense of who you are and what you want and what you deserve in terms of if we're talking about guys or relationships and and knowing that on a very deep level mm. um, will always be a foundation that keeps you steady whatever mm-hmm. external pressures and other things are happening and if you have that I guess um, you're armed against mm. anything that could potentially bring you down so mm-hmm. yeah there are probably a lot more ways to to be reminded of your supposed inadequacies or things you're missing out on yeah. now than there were, but but I think yeah. the same the cure or, or the solution is still the same. It's to really understand your and respect yourself and to to know who you are and what you mm-hmm. that you can wait for things that you want and you don't have to follow the crowd. Um, so I was going to do a quick fire. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just to to lighten. Lighten the mood before we do sort of like the the final two questions that Mm -hmm. I've been asking everyone, um, which has been really good. Teen crush. Um, (laughs) Legolas and uh, Orlando Bloom and um, uh, Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Okay, I like it. Legolas Mm. was one of mine. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> it's the long blonde hair. Yeah, the long flowing blonde hair and very nimble on his feet. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, my my husband actually, I when I met him, I was like, wow, he not only is 
all of those ba- like you know those kind of values led list that I had yeah. kind and interesting and funny he also looks a lot like Hayden Christian <laughs> he still <laughs> denies this but I that's one of the first things I thought about. when you <laughs> saw him love yeah. it what was your if you got a CD or anything what was the first band or song do you remember buying um Bewitched <laughs> oh my gosh yes yeah uh, so this sounds ridiculous now but I know everyone was I felt like at the time Bewitched was Spice Girls were for the cool girls and Bewitched was a little bit more yeah less cool yeah <laughs> but um, I loved Bewitched and I think for a while we were buying me and my sisters and I were buying their singles on the tapes you know yeah I'm yeah. so old when I say talk about tapes. Tapes. tapes we that. ordered it. I did it too. We actually, um, I don't know why our school did it, but we had a school trip to um, a TV show called Mad For It. And when we were on that, we were just in the audience or people got selected to go under the gunk machine or something <laughs> random. Um, and Bewitch were playing because they had bands. Oh, wow. so and you saw live. Yeah, I saw them live. <laughs> I was right there at the front, bopping up and down. I loved TV it. is very jealous. <laughs> It was so good. Um, And I guess I've also been asking people, talking about periods and when you got them. I feel like that's quite an important topic as well. Yeah, definitely. I was a late bloomer and I think that's reflected in everything that I talked about, you know, feeling kind of behind. Yep. um, Or just not quite ready to be a teenager yet. Yep. Or um, when everyone else around me was. Um, I started my period at... 16 I think, okay. 15 or 16, so late in fact that the school nurse had asked my parents if they could take me to the doctor and kind of get tests to see if everything was okay. Oh but wow, actually, everything okay. was fine, so it was just late, I was just a late developer. With periods I've been reading recently about how they're starting earlier because mm-hmm. of the lifestyles that we now lead and the types of diet that people right. have and actually 15, 16 and even 17 was the norm yeah. um, a, a while ago, so... Yeah, so I, I do remember feeling very um, weird for not having yeah. developed boobs yet, and not. I remember begging my mum to buy me a bra way before I needed a bra, but everybody else I was, was wearing, wearing one, and, yeah. Um, yeah, all of that, so mm-hmm. definitely kind of behind, I felt behind, but... Uh, everybody takes their own time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a problem. No. <laughs> um, so on to the last two questions. So looking back and reflecting on, I guess, the journey and the experience that you've been on, what would you advise your younger self? Um, I think I would advise her to really take time to... Uh, learn the difference between intuition and fear and um, mm-hmm. to learn how to to read herself basically and how she's responding to situations okay. and um, really trust her, trust her instincts yeah. uh, trust her intuition yeah. there, there are times when I look back I think the only, the only regrets I have are related to being afraid and feeling in a feeling a, a, an instinct that I should do something but I was too afraid to do it or mm-hmm. to try mm-hmm. uh, and yeah and the times there are a lot of times when I late a little bit later in life uh, I think I started out quite good at listening to my mm-hmm. intuition mm-hmm. Um, and letting letting that kind of guide me but later in life I think I lost that a little bit and so I would say to stick with that um and really trust it and explore it. And I guess what I mean by that is that when I was young, I knew that I loved to write, um, and I wanted to. I was, wanted to write books and mm. fiction. Mm. And um, I think as I got older, I felt like perhaps that was a silly thing, and I could make a living from that. So I stopped. And you were talking yourself it. out of it. Yeah. yeah. But um, I think when you when you know the difference between what you love and what yeah. really lights you up and what really feels right yeah. to you um, and versus something that you feel like is coming from the outside and external expectation or mm. that you should earn money this way or that way or that because something doesn't earn money necessary that it's not as worthwhile mm-hmm. 
that you can then pursue a life that makes you happier and more mm-hmm. fulfilled because you can like, drown out some of those um, external factors telling, you know, voices telling you that something silly to do. It's a silly way to spend yeah. your weekend. Yeah. If you could gift teenage girls all over the world with anything, what would that be? Um, it's a really hard question, so many things, I think. Um, especially, probably, a deep sense of self-worth that's mm. not dependent on what others think of you, I think. Very valuable, precious thing, but it's really hard to have. Yeah, definitely. I like that. That's really powerful. <laughs> well, thank you, Sophie. It's been brilliant chatting. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking me back to my team. Yes, that's all right. Thanks for listening to Becoming Women with me, Ella Sims. If you like the show and want to know more, head to becomingwomen.com or follow me on Twitter or Instagram. I'd love it if you could rate and review this podcast or get in touch as your comments on each episode mean so much to me.